Welcome to Literary Libations with Librarians. And this time we are suggesting books that we think you should pack when you are headed out for vacation. As we share our titles, if there are any that you are interested in getting your hands on, the different formats that are available through the Monroe County Library System will be on the screen. And the quickest way to probably get these titles is to call your local branch of the Monroe County Library System. But you can also go online to our catalog and that web address is on your screen now. And through the catalog, you can request physical versions if there are hardcovers or paperbacks or audiobooks on CD. If a title is listed as being available on Libby or Hoopla, those are two of our um, digital platforms that are available through the Monroe County Library System. Libby offers downloadable ebooks and audiobooks and also magazines. And Hoopla offers downloadable ebooks, audiobooks, and also movies, music, and graphic novels. And the great thing with Hoopla is if you see a lightning bolt next to a title, and almost all the titles have lightning bolts, that means that there is never a wait and multiple people can have the same title checked out at the same time. I am Jennifer Graneski, and I am the area supervisor for Dundee, Maybe, and Petersburg branches. And our question this week to get us kicked off is if you were packing for your dream vacation, where would you be going? And if it were me and it were my dream vacation and cost were no object, I would be headed back to the Mediterranean, in particularly Israel. I had the chance to spend about eight weeks in Israel on a kibbutz with, in 1996 when I was a college student. And so I would love to go back and if cost were no object, I'd love to see Israel again. I'd see Egypt. I'd also want to go to Tunisia and Greece and Italy and just do the whole Mediterranean. So that would be my choice if I could go anywhere. So that's where I would go. Also with us this week is Jessica Otto, our head of collections. And if you were packing for your dream vacation, Jessica, where would you be headed? So I had to put a lot of thought into this. Normally, I like to go places on vacation that are just like extremely hot where I can just be outside and oh, focus on like one of those like lizards on the rock. This is not working for me, sun. which is why I hardly sign up for these anymore. Um, so the so normally I'd like to do that. However, I think my absolute dream vacation would be to take one of these World War II history tours through um, Europe. I, I am a huge fan of World War II uh, history. I've read a lot about specifically the European theater of operations, and I know they have these like organized bus tours where you can go throughout Europe and sort of follow the path that maybe a certain regiment or a company or division um, took during their time in the ETO. So I really, I think if costs were no object, um, that would be something I would just love to do. I don't know how much reading I would get done on such a vacation because I would just be like, try like trying to take in every second of just everything. But I think it, I've spent so much time reading that history. I would love to have even just a moment to live that history. That would be amazing. Thank you, Jessica. Also with us this week for the first time is Adrian Childress. And Adrian is a clerk at our Bedford branch. And if you were packing for your dream vacation, where would you be headed, Adrian? Um, if I could go anywhere, I would really like to go back to. Um, I, I live for a year in Fukushima, Japan. And I lived up in a little mountain village called Minami Aizu. And I would, if I could go anywhere, I would love to go back there and see all the people that I knew, um, catch up, go to my little Heidi spot. It's a beautiful picnic place of kind of under a bridge with the water. It was wonderful. Rice patties all around, very calm, very peaceful. If I could go anywhere, I think that's where I would go. That sounds amazing and like an amazing experience to have been able to live there for a year. Thank you, Adrian. And also with us this week is Jen McCarty, who is our Ellis Circulation Supervisor. And if you were packing for your dream vacation, where would you be headed, Jen? I also had to think about this because there's, I mean, everywhere. Um, <laughs> but I think 
top of my list right now is uh, the UK, like England, London, or England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, hitting all of it. Um, that's that's something that I would love to do ancestrally. I did a DNA test and I really, you know, expected to have some variation and no, it was all just straight like, hi, you're you're white and you are definitely from this particular region. UK, that's like all of me. Um, and I, I just think it would be so great to see everything that that particular region has to offer. So that's that's top of my list right now. Uh, I would love to go to the UK someday. And also maybe with us <laughs> is Sarah Valerius, <laughs> who works at buildings throughout the system at the Monroe County Library System and who has had some frustrating technical difficulties this morning but who just popped back in. And if you were packing for your dream vacation, Sarah, where would you be headed? Hawaii. I've always <laughs> wanted to go. I, I know it's expensive. I know it's the airplane is long. And um, when you get over there, they I know they bring everything over, but I want to swim over there. I always want to hike and go for a run. Always. Or the Grand Caymans too is on my list. Now, I, I've never had, I am not a warm weather person, even though my picture kind of looks like it, but this is in Caesarea, which is in Israel, and um, you're right on the Mediterranean, so I don't think, when I was there, it was the middle of summer, but it didn't feel hot when I was there, um, so I don't know if I could handle Hawaii, but it looks beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Hawaii so, is pretty temperate. I'm not a hot person either. I'm not, you know, crazy like Jessica who like craves desert valley, <laughs> death valley. Um, <laughs> we did Hawaii for our honeymoon and it's like it's it's warm, but it's not like hot. It's it's really really nice. All right. Well, that's good to know. Maybe someday. Maybe yeah. someday. You know, when I win that billion dollar lottery, that You're that's taking us all. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> everybody whole, whole library system <laughs> all right um and because i'm gonna actually have sarah i'm gonna have you kick us off just in case things go glitchy with you again um okay. i will have you talk about your books that you think we should pack when we go on vacation right so i i jumped in last minute because i have just read two books that absolutely just hit the new shelf like I worked at the bookmobile, saw them on the holds, ready and processing. They were on the shelves. I was like, when are these going out? They're like, oh, in a couple of weeks. I said, okay, let me get my holds on them. So I put my holds on them and got them and read them. And I said, oh, these are amazing books. So the first book is The House Across the Lake. This one is, you can kind of picture it in your head because you know, everyone goes up north and there's always these small eerie, this one is very dark and green and you can't see the bottom. So it's a alcoholic widowed actress who is sent there for rehab. It's her family's lake house. She's always grown up there. The kids always say it's haunted because how dark and eerie it is. There's only like six houses around the lake. So as she's drinking, she gets her binoculars out and she's watching the new people move in. And they are millionaires. Well, they have a fight and she disappears. So the lady uh -oh. who is like, well, the husband did it and we have to figure it out. So she gets the police involved, the neighbors involved. Well, come to find out other girls are missing too. So she's like, he killed all the girls. Well, I'm not going to tell you the end so you can figure it out. But <laughs> that one is really good because who doesn't like watching people? I'm a people person. <laughs> I love to watch people. So I was, it was right up my alley when she pulled out her binoculars and they were like, how good are those binoculars? She was like, well, they were my dead husband. So I don't know. They have infrared on them, infrared. So I was like, wait, you can oh even my. see them. Yep. I was like, that's, sign me up. And then the other one is The Wedding Crasher. Now this one I call, these are the romance books, but I call them the swanky ones because they do have a little bit of naughty in them. So if you don't want to read it, just gloss over the pages, which I do. But this one is a girl who's helping her cousin who plans the wedding. You may have lost your audio, Sarah. Oh, oh no. You're back. Okay. Give us a little brief, brief beginning of the wedding crasher again. Sure. So the wedding crasher is um, 
it's a romance with a little bit of swanky love in it if you you know it's got a little hanky panky in it so if you don't like that just gloss over the pages because that's what i do but this one <laughs> the cousin is helping the her cousin is the wedding planner and she needs help so she's like okay i'll come what do you need me to do she says you got so they find her she's in the stairwell with another man not the groom or the groomsman so they're having a conversation about love and he says well you don't love him why are you marrying him she says well it's time it's time to get ready i'm at that age we we have to get married and he's like but you don't love him she says well you're not going to stand up and say anything and come forward with your feelings he says no i'm just not ready to get married yet she says so well i'm off to get married so they find her in the stairwell and she's like uh so the bride's like did you hear everything she says me i didn't hear a thing and like ran down the steps so she goes to the wedding she gets the wedding party in order the bride goes down when they say you know does anybody object she does and the whole congregation the stranger the cousin of the wedding planner stands up and says the bride was in the stairwell five minutes before the wedding and confessed her love to another man who is not the groom not the groomsman and is not even in here so the bride takes off down the aisle in tears and crying and so it's a whole drama about that so you got to find out what what goes on after the wedding what happened to the wedding photographer the cousin the husband to be it was a good one too You'll, the ending was pretty good nice that does sound like drama i cannot yeah. imagine standing yeah. up at a stranger's wedding and go yeah this just shouldn't happen here <laughs> all right thank you sarah and I'm going to ask Jessica if she would share about her vacation reads next. Absolutely. So if you are looking for an unputdownable page turner for your vacation, grab a copy of Target Lancer by Max Allen Collins and take a thrilling ride through the streets of Chicago with private eye to the stars, Nathan Heller, founder and president of the A1 Detective Agency. This 14th book in the Memoirs of Nathan Heller series finds Nathan back in his hometown and reunited with his old flame, the famous dancer Sally Rand. On a Monday morning in October of 1963, Nathan receives a call from friend and fellow investigator Dick Kane, informing him that a man was found dead in his room at the Pitt Congress Hotel with Nathan's business card in his wallet. Does this death have to do with an off the books job that Nathan did for an old friend the week before? Or could it have something to do with Nathan's involvement in Operation Mongoose, in which the CIA enlisted the aid of the mafia to plot an assassination attempt against Fidel Castro? The police have their theory of what's happened, but the evidence tells Nathan that something very different happened in this hotel room. He quickly launches his own investigation. The following day, Nathan is contacted by a former employee, Eben Bolt, who is now a Secret Service agent in the Chicago office. Later that afternoon, Nathan finds himself as a passenger in Eben's car on his way to a meeting with a powerful man that is very concerned about specific threats aimed at President John F. Kennedy, codenamed Lancer. The president is coming to the Windy City in four days and Cuban assassins have been spotted in town. At the conclusion of this meeting, Nathan is appointed a special investigator to the Justice Department tasked with working with the Secret Service to investigate the threats and protect the president at all costs. Over the next few days, Nathan must race against time to stop the assassins, save the president, and find the connection between this conspiracy and the man found dead in the hotel room. Target Lancer is an explosive novel that uncovers new facts about the so-called Chicago plot, a little known but vital piece of the JFK assassination puzzle. Rigorously researched, this book is 
far more truth than fiction. I highly recommend it for fans of detective and mystery novels, crime stories, and thrillers. I also recommend it to anyone with an interest in the JFK um, assassination. Even if you think you've read and know everything there is to know about the assassination, this book will teach you something new. This book highlights what Collins refers to in his afterword as an ignored, virtually forgotten piece of potentially key history. I had never even heard of that. And I know this is historical fiction, right? It is. It is historical fiction. Um, yeah. And everything in this series is there's I think there's 16 books now in this series. But every one of these um, has Nathan Heller, who has his own detective agency. And he's always put into a scenario to investigate either a, a real life crime or a real life um, event. And um, he's done one on Marilyn Monroe's death, one on the um, the death of the Black Dahlia in Hollywood. Um, I think he even did rent on the, on the Roswell crash. So yeah, if you're into historical fiction and want some mystery in there, um, I highly recommend the memoirs of Nathan Heller series. Uh, so continuing with my theme of vacation crime reads, my second title is The Irishman by Charles Brandt. This epic saga of organized crime is told through the eyes of World War II veteran Frank the Irishman Sheeran, a hustler and hitman who worked for legendary crime boss Russell Buffalino alongside some of the most notorious figures of the 20th century. Sheeran would rise to a position of such prominence that in a RICO suit against the Commission of La Cosa Nostra, the U.S. government would name him as one of only two non-Italians in conspiracy with the commission. Sharon is listed alongside the likes of Anthony Tony Pro Provenzano and Anthony Fat Tony Salerno. <laughs> Spanning decades, Sharon's story chronicles one of the greatest unsolved mysteries in American history, the disappearance of legendary union boss Jimmy Hoffa. In the course of nearly five years of recorded interviews, Sharon confessed to Charles Brandt that he handled more than 25 hits for the mob, including his involvement in the death of Jimmy Hoffa, which he says took place at a home in Detroit on the day Hoffa disappeared. Sharon's confession of his involvement with Hoffa's demise launched a new investigation and blood evidence was actually found at the home where Sharon claims that Hoffa met his fate, which seemingly corroborates the Irishman's account. Ultimately, the blood samples found at the house were determined to be too degraded by time as it had been 29 years um, since the disappearance. Um, they were also degraded to, to exposure to air and the heavily trafficked floor. So ultimately, um, the blood samples were unable to provide a conclusive DNA match. So um, as of tomorrow, and tomorrow being July 30th, depending on when you're watching this, um, is will actually be the 47th anniversary of Hoffa's um, disappearance, and it is still officially considered unsolved um, at this time. So I actually read this book while I was on a vacation in Florida when I, I read it not long after it was originally published um, around 2004. And it was originally published under the title, I Heard You Paint Houses. Now, when you, th when you think of the plot that I just described and you hear that original title, you may wonder, what does house painting have to do with a mafia hit me up. So as the book explains, I heard you paint houses is actually a code phrase used by the mafia to refer to something that has nothing to do with houses or paint. Uh, the book was re-released under the name The Irishman in 2019 to coincide with the release of Martin Scorsese's monumental film version of the same name, the film was released on Netflix and stars Robert De Niro as Frank Sheeran, Al Pacino as Jimmy Hoffa, and Joe Pesci as Russell Buffalino. 
The film was nominated for 10 Academy Awards, including Best Motion Picture of the Year. Um, it is an amazing film, but if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend that you read um, the, the book first. There are so many details and characters and plot lines. It's really good to have a good uh, base understanding of all these um, people and who they are and how they relate to each other before getting into the film. Uh, so I highly recommend this book for fans of the true crime genre and also for those who are interested in the disappearance um, of Jimmy Hoffa. I also recommend it for fans of local history. Um, we may not consider this part of our local history, but in truth, Hoffa was last seen alive just an hour away from here in Bloomfield Hills at a restaurant that was at the time called the Marcus Red Fox restaurant, which um, since then has become one of the restaurants in the Andiamo chain um, of restaurants. So this is a fascinating read, a thrilling work of narrative nonfiction with a local history twist that will pull you in from the first page and you will not regret taking this book on your vacation. Excellent, thank you, Jessica. And I will ask Adrian if you will share your vacation reads with us next. All right, um, is my audio okay? Yes, yes. Okay, so I chose two books that they're not overly similar, but they have some stuff in common. Um, they're both fun reads. They both involve characters who are on vacation themselves, and they're both uh, very meta books. Um, starting with uh, My Heart is a Chainsaw, that was uh, Stephen Graham Jones from 2021. Um, it's actually a, the Bram Stoker Award winner for horror novel for 2021. Um, that one is about a girl named Jade Daniels. Uh, she's a half Indian uh, girl who's just graduated, well, graduated from high school. Um, she's she's working that out over her uh, summer break, as it turns out. But she is, she's raised by an abusive father. Her mother's not there. And she has found escape in the world of slasher films. And through the course of the books, her world turns into a slasher film. And it's a, it's a very self-aware kind of horror novel the character like the main character knows okay so in a horror movie here's what's going to happen and then she like talks about the events as they're unfolding and she tries to convince some other characters of where they would fit in a horror movie and there's a it's a lot of dark humor there's there is some some graphic -y sort of descriptions of gore but Overall, it's it's fast paced. It's fun. It's if you're into horror films, there's a lot of references for you to catch and pick up on. Um, so that one, I mean, it's fun. Uh, turning to the other one, the Decagon House Murders. Um, that one, it's not horror. It's a it's a mystery in the style of the Agatha Christie murder series. Um, but again, it's incredibly self-aware because as the character, there's four separate mysteries going on, all sort of stacked on top of one another. Um, there's something that happened six months ago. There's two that are unfolding right now. And then there's one that happened a year ago. And through the course of the novel, you sort of unravel how all of these mysteries are connected. And, but the, the twist is that the characters involved in the Decagon House murders, they're all Agatha Christie murder mystery fans, and they're aware that they're currently living out the plot of, and then there were none. And so some of them try to like, okay, well, in the book, here's what happens, and here's how we can, you know, get around that. But the killer is also <laughs> aware that they're all aware, and so there's a cat and mouse thing of, we are in this book, we know how this book goes. How do we get out of this? Um, and I, I thought it was fun. It's quick, not nothing too deep. Uh, you know, a good a good summer read when you're on a long car ride some, somewhere else. 
Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I just want to give a, I, I will also give a shout out to um, My Heart is a Chainsaw, just because I have read that one and I love Stephen Graham Jones um, and it is amazing. And all I'm going to say is there's a scene with a bear that I still remember. Like, like I don't even, I, I can't even describe it, but it was like, it's it's an amazing scene for a horror novel. He's amazing. And also he's either doing a sequel or a companion to My Heart is a Chainsaw called Don't Fear the Reaper that's supposed to come out in early 2023. So that I believe is already in the Monroe County Library System if you wanna get on the waiting list now. So, and I had not heard of the Decagon, the Decagon murder book, but that sounds amazing too, because I love Agatha Christie. So thank you, Adrian. And I will have Jen share her vacation reads next. The whole time Adrian was talking, I was like, and Jennifer Grudenowski is putting these on her wish list. <laughs> <laughs> and one of them I've already read. So this yeah, checking was, all of her boxes. It was checking all of my boxes. <laughs> okay, so when I think vacation reads, for me personally, I like light and fluffy and fast. So both of mine are very fluffy and very fun. Um, the first one is How to Date a Superhero and Not Die Trying. This book actually just came out. Um, it is in our system for request. So you might have to wait a minute because I don't know if it's on the shelves yet because it's brand new, but I know it is available for request. Um, so How to Date a Superhero. It's set in a world much like our own, except there are superheroes. And so our this book kind of follows, you know, one of the normies. Total boring girl. She's a, in college. She's incredibly career driven. Her name is Astrid. She wants to be a doctor. And that's pretty much what her life is about. She has incredibly strict schedules that she follows. She knows minute by minute what she's supposed to be doing. And she has a plan. And nothing is going to derail her even when there's superhero attacks and things get messy until she finds out that her boyfriend that she loves so much is really kid comment and he's a superhero. And now in addition to her rigorous studies, she also has to attend the program, which is basically how to date a superhero and not die trying. Um, this is kind of romancy, kind of fun, a little bit of sci-fi, or fantasy because obviously the superheroes, but just just easy, light, fun read of this person who, you know, loves her boyfriend, but like, I don't have time for this. <laughs> um, you know, that's that's their big issue. I don't have time for this. Um, I want to graduate and I have a schedule and getting kidnapped by your arch villain is not in the plan. And so it's just, her kind of navigating how to do this and also a little bit of like letting go going, maybe it's okay if everything doesn't go perfectly according to plan. Just a really light read. I read it in like a day. Super fun, very chill. Like I said, it's 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 not a young adult. Technically they're, you know, college age, but you could definitely have like a teenager read this book. It has, it reads very much like a YA. And of course it's, they're in college. So, you know, it's a stress of, all those sorts of things. But that one was really, really fun. Like I said, really kind of light, kind of fluffy. Very good beach read. <laughs> My second one, much the same vein, very light, very fluffy, is Wedding Night by Sophie Kinsella. And if any of you have read any Sophie Kinsella, you know kind of what you're getting into. Um, I was reading some reviews on Goodreads yesterday to kind of like remind myself what happened in this book. And a lot of people didn't like it. Um, I did. I thought it was fun. So our main character in this one's name is um, Lottie. And when the beginning of the, the book, she is positive her boyfriend's about to propose to her. Well, he doesn't. And she's devastated. And then immediately an old flame shows up back into her life. And the two of them decide, you know what? Things were great when we were together, you know, 10 years ago, whatever, on that college fling, when we were in Greece together, let's just get married. Let's just get married. We'll go back to Greece where it all started and have a honeymoon and it's going to be great. So they totally impulsively decide to get married. Well, Lottie's sister, Felicity, or Fliss, 
hears about this and is like, this is stupid. You can't marry a guy you haven't talked to in, you know, however many years. Um, so she embarks on a plan to basically break them up on their honeymoon. Um, Lottie decides, hey, you know, like, we've waited all this time. Let's wait to our wedding night to do intimate things with one another. So Fliss's entire plan is to stop them from ever getting intimate because then it'll be easy to annul the wedding. <laughs> A little bit of a crass plot point, but that's pretty much the plot point. At the same time, the new grooms, his name is Ben. His business partner is also trying to break them up because he's like, this is, you're impulsive and you're stupid and this is not cool. So we have our honeymooners desperately trying to enjoy their honeymoon and the business partner and the sister trying to do anything they can to make sure they don't enjoy the honeymoon. Um, <laughs> Obviously, this one's a little more adult since the major plot point involves adult activities, but really, really funny, really, really light. Um, great locations. The majority of the book takes place in Greece, which sounds beautiful. Haven't been, but would love to. Definitely a fun read. Definitely a fun, like, beachy vacation read. Nothing, you know, nothing earth shattering. You're not going to learn anything about possible presidential, you know, assassinations. <laughs> <laughs> but you get to explore some fun locations, you know, virtually through a book. So definitely a fun read. Excellent. Thank you, Jen. I was surprised Jen, that these were your books because these are normally not the books you read or talk about. And I was like, hey, I'm going to have to um, add Jen to my list. I know. I, occasionally I just read, you know, fluff and that's fun. That's Everybody amazing. needs a little fluff. Yes. Sometimes. <laughs> All right, so for mine, my first one is actually like a middle grade book called The Wretched Water Park. It is by Kirsten White, and it already tells you this is book one of a series, but this one just came out, so the other books are not available yet. And this one I actually listened to with my 13-year-old son on our way to Cedar Point because it's about a two hour drive from our house to get there. So we were chatting about what we wanted to listen to on the trip. And so we chose this audiobook. It's available on Libby and it was so funny. Um, it's just very fun. Like I know it looks like it's a horror novel and you're like, I don't want to give you know my 10 year old a horror novel. It's got horror gothic elements in it, but ultimately it's very fun. So 12 year old twins, Theodora and Alexander, Sinister Winterbottom, that is their hyphenated name. They're the Sinister Winterbottom family, which I just thought was so fun every time the author got to go Sinister Winterbottoms. And their older sister, Wilhelmina, have somehow ended up at their Aunt Sophronia's house for the summer. All three of them agree that they're not entirely sure how they got there. They don't remember a car trip or a plane trip. They just kind of remember being at Aunt Sophronia's. They don't even really remember saying goodbye to their parents. So they're now with their very strange Aunt Sophronia. And Aunt Sophronia decides that what children must enjoy doing is going to amusement parks. So she gets them week-long passes to Fathoms of Fun and a, a water park. So they get there and it is the strangest water park ever. It appears that everything is themed to death in the underworld. Everybody is, all of the staff are dressed in Victorian costumes. When they are assigned their cabana, it looks like a mausoleum. So the kids all take to calling it the caba the cabausoleum. They're going to go put their stuff in the cabausoleum. All of the water slides look like giant tongues coming out from gargoyle mouths. Um, the food place does not have any churros, which is very upsetting for Theodora. Instead, it serves like high English tea and you can enjoy some boiled tongue because what you really want at a water park is boiled tongue. So already this place is strange. They get there the first day. They have an OK time, even though one of the rules is that you absolutely cannot run. And they feel like the staff take this rule overly seriously, that there's no running in the park at all. They're not sure why. The next day when they arrive, 
there's only one other family there and half of the staff has disappeared. And so now the sinister winter bottom clan is getting a little concerned. The third day when they arrive, all the staff is gone except for two people. And neither of those people seem normal or safe. So now it's time for the Scooby senses to kick in and the sinister winter bottoms are gonna have to get to the bottom of what is happening at Fathoms of Fun Water Park. Um, so it's just fun. There's a lot of silly wordplay. Um, I loved all the theming that was in there. Um, and it is, it is the first book, but you do find out in the first book what's going on at the water park. You don't entirely find out what's going on with the Sinister Winterbottom family. So that mystery remains unsolved, but the water park mystery is solved. So it's a good listen. It's four hours long. So it's just about perfect for driving to Cedar Point and home from Cedar Point. So that was excellent. So that's my did, first did you vacation. Did the, uh, the water park at Cedar Point after you listened to the water park story? We did not do Cedar Shores. We just did Cedar Point. And if you ever want to hear my story about my bright idea that, hey, Tony, let's go ride Steel Vengeance together. Let me tell you, that was a bad idea. <laughs> It's a bad idea. He loved it, so it was worth it. My experience was different, but you know, now I know and knowing is half the battle. So my other title, um, for those of you that happen to listen to this occasionally, you know that my two themes seem to be horror and reality television. Um, so a new book came out called How to Win the Bachelor. The Secret to Finding Love and Fame on America's Favorite Reality Show. So yes, I will admit up front, I watched The Bachelor. For those of you that are wondering, The Bachelor has been on TV since 2002. We have had 20 years of The Bachelor. That's probably way too much Bachelor. And trust me, I know that this show has inherent problems. Um, and the authors of this book recognize those problems and they do an entire chapter on the show's um, racism, misogyny, um, lack of body diversity, um, pretty much ableism, pretty much all the things this show has in it. Um, and I am very much aware of that and I continue to watch it and I feel like a bad person, but it also lets me shut my brain off. And there is something fascinating about people pretending to be real on a show that is utterly not real. Um, and that is kind of the premise of this book that sure, the show claims it's about you finding love. It is so not about you finding love. It is about you trying to get sponsored content on your Instagram. It is about you trying to get TikTok followers. That is what it is about now. But it's really fascinating if you watch the show to watch people try not to show that they're playing that game because you're supposed to be there for the right reasons, not to get sponsored content on Instagram someday. So the whole book is about trying to balance this game, because what you really want out of the game is followers that will lead to money. You don't really necessarily want love. You don't even necessarily really want to be the one that they propose to. What you really want is to be the next Bachelor or Bachelorette. And so they go through the whole thing about how to play this game. Like even before you go to the show, you need to make sure that you clear out your Instagram, that you have nothing that people can find online about you. You need to make sure you've got the right clothes. You need to make sure you've budgeted this. You need to talk to your family because if you make it far enough in the game, your family is going to be on TV and they need to play it right or they can ruin your game. Like, it's just fascinating to me. They have all these terms like playing your personal tragedy card at the right time and knowing the four love levels. Yes, there's four, folks. There's one. I'm definitely feeling attracted to you. I'm feeling some sparks. Love level one. Love level two. I can see a future with you. I might be almost falling in love with you. Love level three. You're in love. And love level four, you love them. And you got to play all of those at the right time. Otherwise, you can screw up your game and you won't make it far enough. It, 
I just, the whole book is very funny. It is very tongue in cheek, but like I said, it also looks at some of the problems inherent in the show and suggests that those of us who continue to watch that we need to call out the show on this and say, listen, we're going to watch a show that has people from, that is inclusive instead of being very much a white show with um, traditionally attractive people. So I thought that it, it, I just thought the whole book was fun and silly. The authors also do a podcast called Game of Roses, which I was not familiar with at all prior to reading the book. I've listened to it now. It's fine if you're into The Bachelor, but I don't necessarily need the podcast, but the book was really fun. So, so if you're going on vacation and you need something that's completely silly and you happen to be a person who watches reality TV, knowing that this is not real, and yet at the same time, you just can't turn away from the car crash, pick up how to win the bachelor so all right so thank you to all of you for sharing your vacation reads this week thank you to those of you who have listened or watched and we will be back again in a couple of weeks thanks bye